The next thing we want to talk about with respect to the Fourier series is some conditions about existence. It turns out the Fourier series doesn't exist for all signals. For most of the signals we tend to deal with, it does, but there are some mathematical criteria for determining if the Fourier series actually exists or not. So let's talk about that. The two criteria are, are as follows. The first one is that the coefficients have to be finite, which kind of makes sense. If I end up with an A0 or an AN or BN that blows up to infinity, then when I plug into my equation, I'm going to have a very ill-defined equation. So one criteria is these equations need to be finite. One thing that's easy to check is that this always happens anytime the signal we're working with is absolutely integrable on the time interval that you're working on. So remember, for the Fourier series, we pick a time interval, some t naught length time interval that we try to represent the signal. If on that time interval, we can take the integral of the absolute value of the signal and get a number less than infinity, this right here, by definition, is what we mean by absolutely integrable. Absolutely integral. If that is less than infinity, then we will always have finite coefficients a0, a n, and b n. Satisfying this condition of being absolutely integrable on um, the time interval t naught has a name. It's what we call the weak der Schley condition. Okay. If our signal that we're working with satisfies this, then we're going to have a Fourier series that exists but it still may not converge at every single point. Remember we said a while ago that our representation isn't a pointwise equality. So this doesn't guarantee that we have pointwise equality. It just says that the Fourier series representation exists in terms of these being finite anytime this weak condition is satisfied. But we still might not have pointwise convergence everywhere. We'll talk about convergence here in a little bit some more. The other condition that we worry about uh, making sure that a signal has a Fourier series representation is we, we must have an f of t that only has a finite number of maximum and minimum in one period t naught and only a finite number of discontinuities in one period. So any signal I can draw on the you know, chalkboard or that you can you know, think of and sketch is pretty much going to have a finite number of maxes and mins and a finite number of discontinuities. So most real-world signals, anything we would do in the real world is going to satisfy this. Mathematically, you can construct kind of weird signals that end up having an infinite number of discontinuities or an infinite number of maxes and mins in some time period, but we tend to not work with those in this class. Signals that satisfy this, we say satisfy the strong Dirichlet condition. And if this is true, then the Fourier series exists and is convergent at every single point. So most of the things we encounter will encounter this and hence have this stronger convergence property. In the examples that we worked a couple videos ago, we saw that we could exploit symmetry to really simplify our computations. Let's just kind of recap some of the uh, highlights and summarize the equations from that. First, let's talk about um, just the general equations that we use when computing the Fourier series coefficients. Here's our equation for A0, here's our equation for AN, and here's our equation for BN. Really, I probably could have written these a little bit more generally. These integrals don't have to go from minus t0 over 2 to t0 over 2. Really, you can integrate over any interval of width t0 that you care about. All right, so I usually think about that as you know 0 to t0 or minus t0 over 2 to t0 over 2, but really these are just whatever time interval you want to integrate over t0. So these are the equations for general signals. If we are working with an even signal, then we don't want any sinusoids. So we talked about this. That means all the bn's need to be zero because sine is odd. I can't have those terms. We can simplify our computations of the a's greatly. We can exploit symmetry and only in integrate over an interval of width t naught over two if we multiply by two. And then the same thing in this integral right here. Integrate over an interval of width t naught over two and then multiply by two out front. So these are simplified equations for a0 and an for the special case where we have even symmetry. And then the similar or the uh, corresponding case for when we're dealing with an odd signal, we don't want any cosines, 
So the a's have to go to zero, and this is the equation that we can use for bn. I don't integrate over an interval of width t naught. I integrate over an arbitrary interval of width t naught over 2, and then I multiply by 2 out front. 2 times 2 is 4. Another type of symmetry that we might see sometimes is what's called half-wave symmetry. That means a signal that when shifted by half of the period is the same except there's a minus change in amplitude. So if I take my original signal, shift it t naught over 2, if I end up with what I had before just flipped on the amplitude axis, that's called half-wave symmetry. One thing about half-wave symmetry signals you can show is that they never have any even-numbered harmonics. So that means A2, A4, A6, A8, all the way up to infinity, B2, B4, B6, B8, all the way up to infinity. All of the even-numbered harmonics have to be equal to zero. So this is just something nice to know sometimes. If you're dealing with a signal that has this symmetry, then you know right away that there's a lot of zeros in these coefficients. And if you get done with your answer and you say that that does have even-numbered harmonics, well, that's a problem because you've probably done something wrong.